All right, guys. Um, we're going to start a new series today called The Marriage. When I married my fan and, uh, you know, I've always been in toxic relationships. That's symptomatic of being a drug addict. But this particular relationship was hellacious. You know, it was sociopathic. It was crazy. And uh, I'm going to tell you guys what happened. So we end up getting married. I told you guys that in the last video. And I don't want to say her name. I don't want to put her on blast. But um, the night that we got married, we got a bunch of coke and we smoked it. And I mean, we smoked crack all night. <clears throat> I, I think I had been off heroin. I may have been off heroin. I think I was off heroin the week that she was out here before we got married. I was. I was off heroin. And the night we got married, I went to go pick up more coke at like 5 in the morning. And the coke dealer had heroin, so I did a speedball at the house. And that speedball just sent me right back into full-blown heroin addiction. Instantly. I swear to God, if you, if you relapse with the speedball, like mixing coke and heroin, it intensifies your urge to keep going the next day and everyone knows when you you know you can do heroin two days by the third day you're physically hooked on heroin so heroin addicts try to just do it two days in a row you always see people relapse try to do it for two days it's very hard to do that because that voice in your head tells you to keep going then you do the third day and you're fucked so i'm strung out on heroin she lived in denver and i didn't know much about her i mean we connected on Facebook and she gave me her number and I called her and she was just like a really good listener, you know, that's always a big thing with women, you know, if they're, if they're a good listener, then I tend to cling on to them, you know, and I just want to vent to someone, I guess. And so we really connected that way, but I didn't know much about her, you know, and selfish addiction at the time so it's not like I was asking questions like I'm in a healthy relationship now and like I talk to my wife all the time and we have beautiful conversations and I'm I'm happy but with this one it was it was very strange from the beginning so she was an executive assistant out in Colorado in Littleton um the same town that the Columbine shooting happened in it's right outside of Denver and she was working there and she also had a five-year-old son but the dad had taken off I didn't really know much details about it but I knew that she had a kid and that she lived with a roommate in a house in Denver and she was making good money out there I don't know what it was but I mean 80,000 a year maybe it might be more I don't know she I mean she had when we met, she had money. I don't know, maybe 80000 is too much, but she was making a good salary. And, you know, after we got married and we smoked crack all night, she flew back to Denver, <laughs> you know, back to her life. And we never really talked about the logistics of it. I was still on federal probation, and switching states like that's complicated, but she wanted me to go out there. Now I had that $6,000 from <clears throat> selling foreign rights to my book, which was never even published, but I got the money for it. And I don't know, I think I was down to like 2,500 maybe out of 6,000. I mean, when she was here, I was buying like the best cocaine I could get, like uh, moon rock MDMA and we're just, you know, constantly going to bars and running up two three hundred dollar tabs eating you know and just staying at like five star hotels you know we were living it up and I think she thought that I had more money than I had you know to her she was a fan of my book my book was pretty obscure at the time I mean I had like you know a little following but not you know um anyway she, she was like one of the hardcore fans and I ended up just jumping into a relationship with her, which was weird. 
was kind of at a stagnant point in my life where I was trying to write another book and I didn't know what to write about and I kind of just jumped into it just to see where it took me. You know, in retrospect, that was a very, very, very toxic decision because she had a child. And that's the most tragic part of this story is that there was a five-year-old kid involved. With the rest of the money that I had, I, wa I want to say it was $2,500. Um, I asked my friend Steve, um, who's a really good underground hip-hop artist here in L.A. Um, his name's Riggy Mars. I'll leave a link for his music. Uh, he's coming out with an album really soon. He's really good. But that's how I was hanging out with in Pasadena. And I asked him um, if he could hook up like some quantities of drugs because my plan was to smuggle a bunch of like exotic, hard to find drugs in California. They probably didn't have in Denver and bring it to Denver, go like live out there and just live off selling these drugs. That was my delusional plan at the time. So Steve told me that he had a friend in Pasadena, we'll call him Bob, and he told me that he knew a guy that just had like ridiculous amounts of weight, you know, kind of like in how I made half a million dollars, like it was that kind of person. But he's like, he won't, he won't, he won't do business with me because Steve had pistol whipped him. Now Steve is like a scrawny white guy, right? I'm not saying he doesn't look intimidating, but like I usually don't believe people when they tell me stuff. And he told me that he pistol whipped this drug dealer. And I just, I, I hadn't known him that long. So I didn't know how like Steve's a psychopath, you know, he's 16 months sober right now and he's doing great. He's in AA and he's like turned his life around. But back then, I mean, he was a straight gangster, you know, and he was like the only person I knew in Pasadena. And I guess he had pistol with this guy that had all these drugs. But he gave me his number and I called him. He's like, just call him and see, maybe he'll work, he'll do something with you. And like, he was my kind of guy, you know, he talked more like me. We instantly connected when I call, I called him and I'm like, hey, look, I got your number from Steve. I know you guys had a problem. And like, he straight told me on the phone, this guy, Bob, like yeah Steve pistol with me I couldn't believe that that was true I was like Jesus Christ <clears throat> and he ended up letting me come over um my ex or my ex-wife is in Denver at the time and I'm planning on picking up drugs and flying to uh Denver you know and like just smuggling them which is very hard to do right now like airport security is hardcore so I met up with this guy and sure enough he had ridiculous amounts of drugs you know he had vial upon vial of ketamine he had vial upon vial of lsd liquid lsd he had blotter acid he had uh, mushrooms he had pcp he had everything and he had quantity of it and i forget how much i gave him but i gave him a lot you know like over two grand and he he just hooked me up like really fat i had this huge sack of like molly i had mdma uh, moon rocks <clears throat> and I had, he gave me a lot of GHB, he gave me cocaine. I just had a bunch of different drugs. And I didn't go right to Denver. I went back to Santa Barbara and I, I sold some of the drugs. And I think I, you know, I got like, made like five grand and I put that in my bank account. And I still had some of the moon rocks left and I still had some of the LSD. I had a, a vial of LSD. And I told my ex-wife to, because she was like in the rave scene. I mean, the more corporate, you know, going to nightclubs and listening to, you know, EDM music, like that kind of person, but does ecstasy all the time. She's like an ecstasy princess. Kind of like the, the, you know, Blair in my book. She was kind of like that, but I wrote that book way before I met her, but she was like all into electronic music. So she knew a lot of people that would probably want acid. She uh, arranged for it, and she said that that's what they wanted. So I decided just to take a vial LSD with 100 hits to Denver. I was going to sell the hits for 20 bucks on a sugar cube because this acid was was re was legit, you know? Uh, Steve and I tried it. Like uh, He did it alone. I did it a few times um, with some of my friends, but it was like really strong acid. And so I decided to fly out to Denver with this little vial. 
really knowing nothing about this girl that I just married. I mean, it like completely clueless. Oh, and uh, I forgot to mention, when I was with Bob, <coughs> he asked me if I wanted any liquid Xanax. I'd never heard of that, you know? That's like an obscure drug, I guess. I mean, I'd heard of like powder Xanax and like generic ones that people pressed in pill presses, but I had never heard of liquid Xanax. And he had like gallons of it. And he's like, yeah, it's real. <laughs> you get a syringe, you pull out, you know, it's a hundred, you get, pull it all the way to a hundred and that's one hit. Um, and that's taking his annex bar. So he gave me this like little pint full of it. You know, it was like a pint of alcohol and he just filled it up and he just gave it to me for free. So in addition to all the drugs that I bought off him, he also gave me this liquid Xanax, which was completely new to me. I mean, like I said, I never even heard of it. So, um, I plan to fly to Denver. I have like $5,000 in my bank account. I think even more because I flipped all those drugs and like super quick and I just felt good. Like I'm like, okay, I have money in the bank. I'm going to bring this file. I'm going to make a shitload of money. I'm going to sell each hit for 20 bucks. Um, it's going to be cool. <clears throat> so the night before my ex-wife calls me and she's like, Hey, can you get some, um, can you get some Coke? And I already sold the Coke that he had given me up in Santa Barbara. She's like, I really want you to bring some of that good L.A. Coke to Denver. She said it's better in L.A. Um, which is probably true. I don't know, though. Um, so I said, sure. And, you know, I was staying at a hotel in, like, Inglewood, waiting to take a flight the next day to Denver. So I called my connection. And I said, hey, um, can you do an eight ball white? In different counties, people say different stuff. Like a lot of people call meth white. A lot of people call cocaine white. A lot of people call meth clear. It's very confusing. I don't know. It's different. People say different things. And that's how people misconstrue what you say over the phone. Because when I met up with him, I was expecting an eight ball of coke. And he brought me an eight ball of China white heroin. Don't remember what I paid for it, but I bought it. And, you know, I was like, hey, I'm, I really need Coke. Can you get more or can you bring me Coke at the hotel? He said that he would. So I have this uh, eight ball of China white and, you know, I already have a habit from after I got married. I'm, I'm, I'm chipping away. I'm not doing much half grams and stuff. And I have to go to like, you know, in California, I don't know how it is in other states, but we have law that just got passed, if, I don't know, five or six years ago, where, you know, pharmacies, it's discretionary, it's discretionary upon pharmacies who want to actually participate in the program, but some pharmacies sell insulin syringes, you know, so you can just go up to the counter and buy them. They give you weird looks for sure, you know, and I, like, I always fuck with him. I'm like, yeah, it's for heroin. Thanks. And they're just like, what the fuck? And so he's like some Asian lady. And she's like, oh, uh. So I buy a pack of needles. And I'm all, I'm super stoked. I'm like, oh, cool. I got this eight ball of, I didn't know what I was going to do in Denver. I was going to be out. I had like maybe a gram or two at Black Tar. I was like, fuck, I'm screwed if if I can't get it in, in Colorado. But I was pretty confident I could just go to a methadone clinic and find junkies. You can, you know. So, <clears throat> I'm sitting in the parking lot at, at, the, at this pharmacy where I bought the needles, and I have like a, I think I have like a Monster Energy drink can, and I make it into a makeshift cooker. Like, you know, throughout the years, I've like perfected the origami of like crushing the Monster can, twisting it, and then like making a perfect cooker out of it. So I make this cooker out of this Monster can, and throw in like pretty small amount of China white. It's California, it's probably fentanyl and lactose or something, you know, it's probably not real like East Coast China white. <clears throat> so I put it in the spoon, I cook it up, and as I'm cooking it up, a cop pulls up. And I'm like, F 
fuck. I have the China White and I have the liquid Xanax in the car, like in a pint. So it like looks like I've been drinking. It's just like chilling like on my passenger side. I don't know for whatever reason it was. And uh, I'm like, fuck. So I take the cooker and I put it under my seat. I get the eight ball of China White and I keister it, stick it up my butthole. And I look at the pint and I just fucking grab it and I just drink it. It's liquid Xanax. Who knows how much Xanax I just took. I did it because I didn't want the cop to see... I didn't want him to see the container. Um, and so I drank it real quick and then I just put it under the seat, you know, so it was an empty bottle. And, you know, I'm in Inglewood and I'm white and it's a predominantly black area. And the cop comes up to me and, you know, he's like, what are you doing? And I just told him, I was like, hey, I'm flying to Denver tomorrow. I got a hotel. I told him which hotel I was staying at. He's like, what are you doing at the pharmacy? I was like, I don't know. I was just stocking up on snacks and stuff. He's like, do you have the snacks? Luckily, I had bought some snacks, and, like, I showed him in the back of the, in the, it was in my back seat, showed him this bag of, like, candy, you know, shit heroin addicts buy, and he's like, okay, cool, have a nice night, so I'm like, all right, cool, and so he leaves, and I'm such a junkie that I, like, you would think I would pull out of the parking lot, but of course, I just, like, watch, I, like, wave to him as he's leaving, and, like, pull out the cooker, and I start cooking it up. So I shoot the China White, and it's really good. I get, like, a rush off it, but I had drinking the liquid Xanax. I had no idea how much I drank. I woke up the next morning, like, I blacked out, right? Hard. I woke up the next morning, and uh, I was at my hotel, but my car, but I was parked in my car. Like, I was just sitting in the driver's seat, and I was just hunched over my, my steering wheel, so I figured that I must have made it back to the hotel, but I couldn't take it any longer. And I just nodded out and passed out on the steering wheel. I'm like, fuck, what time is it? I forgot when my flight was like at 10 in the morning or something. And I look at my clock and it's like 9.14. I'm like, fuck, you know, I'm like a mile away from the airport. So I go to it and I miss the flight. I'm like, oh my God. And I had taken the acid and I'd put in a cologne sample vial, you know, that like they give you at like Nordstrom's or Macy's. And I put an entire vial in one of those cologne things. So I had that in like my dop kit with like my razors. That's what I was going to take on the plane. I was actually going to walk on the plane with it, just, you know, with anything that I've ever done that's super sketchy. I mean, you get caught on an airplane with a hundred hits of liquid LSD, you're going to, pri- you're going to prison for like 40 fucking years. That's how the feds look at that. It's a very serious crime. And, uh, you know, I was planning on doing it and now I took that liquid Xanax and it's just like coming in waves where I'm like cool for a little bit. And then I'm just like, you know, belligerent again. And I'm belligerent at the airport because I missed the flight. And I'm like, dude, can I fl- fly standby? And she's like, no, you have to buy another ticket. It's $700. I'm like, fuck it. And I just gave her my debit card. I'm like, whatever. She's like, okay, it's at four o'clock. I'm like, okay. So I call my ex-wife and I'm like, hey, I missed the first flight. I had a little accident last night. I drank like liquid Xanax. And she's just like, what the fuck? And I'm like, look, I didn't do it on purpose. I'm, I'm getting on the next flight. It's at four. She's like, all right, cool. So I went to the terminal and I sat down, I had a book, and I just nodded out, passed out, woke up at like 11 o'clock at night, missed the second flight that I paid for, I paid like $700 for that flight, and, um, you know, some security woke me up, they're like, are you all right, I'm like, man, I just got surgery, and I'm on these super sedative medications, and they're like, oh my god, sir, we're so sorry to hear that, and they like, grabbed a wheelchair, and they were like, escorting me to like, vending machines, and like, buying coke cokes for me I was like dude felt like such a scumbag you know and uh anyway so you know of course my ex-wife's blowing my phone up what the fuck's going on and I have to tell her I'm like hey I missed the second flight too I'm like this whatever I drank last night I'm, I'm going in and out of consciousness and like at this point she's livid, you know? It's like this is like gonna foreshadow what our marriage is gonna look like. I mean, she is a five year old she's gonna introduce me to. And I'm so fucked up I can't even make a make a flight. So 
there was like a late flight at LAX. This was at Burbank Airport or something. And, um, because I missed the first one at LAX, and I had to go to Burbank, and then I had to go to, now I'm going back to LAX. There's like one late one. So I get there, and I buy another ticket, and they have a restaurant with a bar. I was like, all right, cool. Now, you know, everyone knows drinking in Xanax is like, <laughs> it's no bueno. So I'm sitting at this bar and I'm just ordering Jack and Coke doubles. And I'm not realizing I'm dr like, you know, it's one of those places where when you put the cup down, they don't take it. It's just they like leave it till you're done. And I look over and there's like five or six of these cups and all of them are Jack and Coke doubles. And I'm like, fuck, I'm already like super groggy off that liquid Xanax or whatever he gave me. Like liquids, I've never even heard of that since that, but whatever. I'm sure it exists because I had it um, and it worked. So I, I get pretty wasted, like where I'm stumbling. You know, I think the Xanax is just throwing my equilibrium off. I mean, you know, it's central nervous system is like just not working correctly. But I finally stumble on a plane. I'm reading a Hunter S. Thompson book, I remember, and I sit in my seat. And I go to read the book, and my head just falls in it. And, I, like, I just pass out trying to read the book, you know? Like, my hat, my hat, my, my, yeah, face sags, like, into my shirt. So I'm just, like, nodding out. I look like a heroin addict you'd see, like, on a park bench in New York, you know? Like, it's super obvious. I'm just completely loaded. Two U.S. Marshals come, and they escort me off the plane. They say I'm too inebriated to fly. So this is the third flight that I've missed. I have to, um, you know, I have to make like a 6 o'clock a.m. flight. And they, they actually, I didn't have to buy a new ticket. They gave me a ticket for 6 a.m. for free. And uh, so I'm, I leave and I have a friend that lives in Redondo Beach, which is like South Bay, L.A. And I call him. He's a big old cokehead. And I t explained my situation. He's like, yeah, I'm just snorting coke at my house, drinking. Come over. It's like, cool. I had this awesome fucking house in, you know, Redondo Beach. It's just beautiful. And I get in there, and me and him just snort below all night long. He ends up giving me an eight ball. So I, I actually got to bring that to um, Denver. I keistered it. Um, but we stayed up all night snorting coke. And what it did is it just, like, kind of counteracted the effects of the liquid Xanax where I was quasi-functional. <clears throat> so he drives me to the airport. I mean, we're coked out. We're, like, having coke conversations in the car and, like, smoking cloves. Just weird cokehead shit, you know? But I finally make it to the airport, and I get on the flight, and they let, they let me fly this time. You know, like, the coke allowed me to act more normal. So... I remember my heart was beating really fast on that flight. I mean, I'd gone through security, and my bags was one of the ones that got flagged. They actually opened my DOP kit with the vial acid in it, but it looks like a cologne sample, so they didn't even they didn't even mess with it. And then I had this eight ball stuck up my ass, and I had some heroin. And, um... <clears throat> You know, they let me on, but my heart's just thudding the whole time. I'm petrified. Like, I know what the consequences of... L they The feds hate LSD, even small amounts like that. But I take the flight, and I end up getting picked up by her at the Denver airport the next morning. And she's furious at me, you know? Um, oh, uh, I, I took a hit of acid on the airplane, too. Just, I don't know why. I think it's just because I was drunk. So by the time that I saw her, I was tripping on acid and like totally in just saying weird stuff. And we start fighting right away. And what she tells me is that her roommate had Googled me. And if you Google me, I'm sure you'll find articles that were written like a long time ago about bad things that I've done. You know, because I'm candid and I, op I open up about it. I think it's important. It helps dissuade people from making the same mistakes. I think it's very important to be transparent, to tell the truth about what you've been through. Um, so I would open up in these articles, and she had read them. So she told my ex-wife, I don't want him in my house. He's a convict. 
you know, and uh, by the way, I'm in Denver completely disobeying federal probation rules. Like if they knew I flew to Denver, I would be arrested instantly. But I mean, I just, that era was a bunch of fuck it, you know? And, you know, she's yelling at me and she's telling me that her roommate had Googled my name found those articles and there was no way that I could stay at their house, which was like what the plan was. I mean, she rented a room, a couple rooms out of like a pretty big house. Like they had a nice setup. So we end up getting a hotel. Um, I'm on acid and I remember I was just watching Return of the Jedi. Um, well, you know, and she was like in the room doing makeup and telling me how I basically ruined, um, you know, the first time that I came to Denver, like whatever the fuck that means. But, um, you know, she was right away. We're, we're doing Coke together and we're just, we're just, you know, and that's what we do. We have a drug, our entire relationship is predicated off drugs. So we like, you know, just have a Coke night in this hotel and I'm shooting heroin low key in the bathroom. And I'm really freaked out because I'm not allowed to stay at her house and I have a finite amount of money, you know, it's like, it's going to run out. Plus, how am I going to get more heroin? I have a habit. I'm just like, yeah, just, you know, being at the hotel complicated a lot of stuff. So she had to go to work the next morning, you know, and she got in this very formal attire and I took her to work she let me use her car. So at this point, my alcoholism had reached a troubling period, like where I'm waking up and drinking. Like I drink, I drink in the morning, like people drink coffee, you know, I'm starting, I mean, at the end of my alcoholism, it was like, you know, drinking all day long out of a bottle, but you know, I'd wake up and I make a screwdriver and just, get a good buzz on and I didn't realize it but I was I was an alcoholic at that point I mean I had to drink you know there's don't the like there's so many pictures of us from when I was married and I'm always holding a drink with like a little straw in it or something but um you know she she wanted me to meet her son and you know uh I've told this story before, like on the album, but it's important for the chronology of our marriage. I wasn't allowed at her house. Her roommate was taking care of her son, babysitting him. So we kind of just hold up in motels for a few days. Now I'm running out of heroin at a alarming rate. So I go on Facebook and I'm like, Hey, I'm in Denver. Does anyone, do I have friends here? And this guy hit me up who's a heroin addict. He's a very, very, very well-known glass blower. He he's he like can blow bubblers that like you know that celebrities buy that are like six thousand dollars, like very intricate, blown, like crazy glass usable art. And he's you know he's been featured in High Times, like he's very well known in that community. And I've known him for years. I called him and he was just being a heroin addict in a hotel with his girlfriend. So I instantly had a connection and my ex-wife would go to work and while she was at work, I drive to my friend's house, the glass blower or the motel, and we would do heroin. And it was really weird in Denver, the way that it worked. Um, like the people that he was getting it from were Paisas, but he had to call a number at like eight in the morning and put in an order. Like you have to put in an order. It's like a straight up business and it's weird. I've done dope in a lot of states, but it was really weird in Denver. You like at eight o'clock is when shop hours open and you have to make an order and they'll tell you, okay, stay at that location. We'll be there within the next four hours, which is like really cruel when you're addicted to heroin. It's like, what a weird system. So that's what we would do. I'd, I'd drop her off and I'd always just be waiting, you know, and I'd be like telling him ahead of time, okay, get a gram, get a gram. And I started just getting really strung out. I started getting really drunk. And 
my ex-wife, um, you know, got to a point where she wanted me to meet her son because essentially I was, I mean, I, I was a stepdad at that point and I was willing to take on that responsibility or I thought I was, it was a, it was a bad call looking back, but she told me that she wanted me to be completely sober when I met her son. I was like, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. She's like, like, I don't want you to drink one thing today. Now you have to realize I had been drinking like really heavily, like really, really, like two fifths a day for like over a month, two months. Like I was like just on a straight up bender with alcohol and I just stopped. I was like, okay, I'll stop. You know, like I didn't, I really didn't think I drank enough to get DTs. So that night we're supposed to meet her son and for some reason we can't do it. Um, I don't know, scheduling conflicts. He's got like his daycare thing. Um, they do like overnight. So instead of going to see her son, we, we ended up going to her aunt's place and we were able to stay there. And she went to bed before me and I was laying in the bed and the entire bed just starts shaking. It's like, ba 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 I mean, it's like hard. It's like exorcist hard. It's just like, it's almost, it's not levitating, but like the entire bed is shaking. It's crazy. And I don't feel good. I feel like I have cotton fever. I just did a shot of heroin in their bathroom and they didn't have any Q-tips and they didn't, I didn't have a spoon. So like I had to open like an old deodorant bottle and just kind of like put water on it and, you know, break it down like that. And I shot it and then right when I like maybe like 20 minutes later in bed, I started feeling cotton fever. And for those of you that don't know what that is, um, when you do heroin, you need to cook it on something, you know, whether it be a cooker, a can, most commonly a spoon, that's my choice. Um, and you use cottons, you know, cause you don't want to barb the needle. It's not to filter shit out. You just don't want the needle get, to get barbed. You want the needle to be perfectly sharp. If it just touches the spoon, when sharp touches metal, it'll dull it. So it dulls the needle and you don't, you know, it's so you, there's always a cotton. And what happens is bacteria builds up. And if you do a shot, a lot of times with old cottons where there's like some sort of spore, some sort of, you know, bacteria growing in it, uh, you can't see it. Obviously it's invisible. And when you go to shoot it, you get cotton fever and you start shaking violently and puking and you get a really big fever and there's nothing you can do about it. I mean, I've heard people say you can keep shooting heroin and get past it, but I've always just kind of dealt with it and, uh, it's an awful thing. So when I'm in bed with her, I had just done a shot. I for sure assumed that I had cotton fever, but I mean, I was really shaking, right? And she gets up and she's like, what's up with you? And sweat's just pouring down my face, you know? And I'm just, sh I cannot stop shaking. Like, I'm just, I'm shaking, like, hard. It's not like in the movies where you get the trembling hands. Like, my whole body's shaking. And she starts getting on Google, and she's like, I think you might have DTs. I think you might be going through alcohol withdrawal. I'm like, I don't drink that much. I don't think so. I've been to a lot of rehabs. Like, I know what's up with alcohol. So, um, she's like, I think we have some Heineken. I think my aunt has some Heineken. So she brought me, like, three I just pounded three Heinekens really quick and it got me well. And like got me well as if when I was strung out on heroin and I got dope and it made me feel, you know, it got me well. It's the exact same feeling. And it was a scary moment because it verified the fact that I was an alcoholic. And that was just the beginning. Like my alcoholism and my relationship with her gets so fucking weird and interesting. Like I cannot wait for this saga, the marriage, because so much weird shit went down in just a year. It was a weird time period, and uh, I think you guys will enjoy it. All right, I'm going to wrap for now. I want you guys to know that I'm kicking subs. I'm on the other meds, but it doesn't matter. You know, I want to be better. Stop commenting weird shit. You know, I'm doing my thing because I want to be a good father, and that's solid. I don't give if you don't. If you don't see it that way, then you should, probably should watch a home improvement channel. But for the rest of you, I love you. Palabra. We'll be back.